you know that sometimes false expectations can torpedo you. So, for instance, mothers in the room, at one point or another, you bought a new dress for your teenage daughter, or a new pair of shoes for your teenage daughter, or a new jacket for your teenage daughter, uh, and somewhere in your heart was the expectation that your daughter would respond with gratitude. <laughs> now, how realistic was that expectation? <laughs> Instead, what you got was, oh, it's the wrong color, or this is so last year. So there's an importance to expectation management when dealing with a teenager. Uh, you, you should expect a teenage girl to act like a teenage girl, right? And if you don't, then it can lead you to be angry or it can lead you to be frustrated or it can lead you to be disillusioned. But I think also as believers, we need to have proper spiritual expectations. We have to have expectations that are biblical or else sometimes we find ourselves angry or frustrated or disillusioned. So I think sometimes my expectation is this, and maybe this resonates with you, with you as well. We hear, you know, we read from the Bible and we hear Jesus talking about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And my, my default expectation is this, I will, I will hunger and thirst for righteousness and therefore I will grow in mercy, I will grow in purity of heart, and I will grow in my ability to live and to act as a peacemaker. And these traits, as they grow in me and have more more outworking in my life, these will lead all people to like me and respect me, and my life will be one of comfort and dignity and peace. <laughs> How does that expectation work out? See, Jesus taught that there is transformational power in hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and we looked at that last week. It is true that as you hunger and thirst for righteousness, he, he works in you to recreate his own character in you. And through this, this transformational power, the king changes you, his citizens, and he recreates his character in you. And it's a beautiful thing. But it does not follow. It does not follow that your life will therefore necessarily be rosy simply because you are, as Jesus said, in a state of spiritual blessedness, right? He said, blessed are you. It didn't mean necessarily that you were going to be happy all the time. It wasn't really even an emotion to begin with, but he proclaimed you to be in a state of spiritual blessedness on account of these various attributes that we walked through last week. That doesn't mean that life is always going to be rosy, but it does mean that you are blessed of your king, and so Christ teaches about realistic expectations for you who are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And so I would invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. This morning we'll be looking at verses 10 through 16 as Christ sets for us some realistic expectations of, of what we can expect to result from our pursuit, our hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And so as I read these words, have this question in mind, what responses should kingdom disciples expect from the world? So when you actually live as a disciple, when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, when you live for Christ in the world, what, what types of responses should you expect from the world? And Jesus teaches that disciples should expect that, that a disciple will suffer persecution sometimes. You should expect that as a disciple, you will prevent decay like salt prevents rot. And as a disciple, you should expect that you will shine light, particularly that you will shine the light of Christ into a dark world. And so it's with that in mind that I'll read from Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 10. And as we read together, let's remember that this is God's holy word. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? 
It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, beloved, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. And so if we ask this question, well, what responses should we kingdom citizens, kingdom disciples, expect from the world when we're about the business of hungering and thirsting for righteousness, what should we expect? Jesus says, firstly, that disciples will suffer persecution. You should expect it. It shouldn't be something that surprises you, but you should expect that you will suffer some form of persecution for the sake of Christ. So Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Again, blessedness is not a feeling that I am blessed, but rather it is a state of spiritual blessedness that you possess. Now, Paul talks about this state of blessedness and, and the, the fact that we'll suffer for Christ in Philippians 1.29. He says, it's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And in 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 14, Peter says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, suffering is normal for believers. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now, those things are not hard to understand, but they are hard to trust while you're enduring it. Now, I don't find it difficult to understand that I'm actually blessed when I have to suffer for the sake of Christ, but what I do find it difficult is to trust my Father, my Heavenly Father, while I'm going through the process of being being slandered for the sake of Christ, or being yelled at for the sake of Christ, or being abused for the sake of Christ, or being persecuted for the sake of Christ, it's, it's hard to feel blessed, and therefore it's hard to rejoice. It's not difficult to understand, but it is difficult to live out. But I want you to remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10, a disciple's not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his Master, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? And I want you to keep that in mind because as you th hunger and thirst for righteousness, ultimately what you're hoping for is that the, that the Lord will, through the power of the Holy Spirit, transform you more and more into the image of Christ who is redeeming you. You want more of his character in you. You want him to burn away the dross so that the gold shines forth. But I want you to remember that as that process takes place, Jesus was perfectly merciful. He was perfectly pure in heart. He was purpose, purpose, pur perfectly peaceful. That's what I wanted to say. And yet the world hated him. And ultimately they murdered him. So how can this be considered blessed then? If that's what if that's a, a realistic expectation for what it's like for kingdom disciples who really hunger and thirst for righteousness, how can that be considered blessed? Well, again, it's not, not necessarily happiness. It's not necessarily emotion at all. It's a state of spiritual blessedness. And I want you to think of it this way. Persecution for righteousness' sake, and that's an important caveat, and we'll get back to that in a moment, but persecution proves that you belong to Christ by faith. Do you see that? Persecution is like proof of purchase. It's, persecution proves that at least in some way, your character and your conduct in the world is so much like Christ's that it provokes the same reaction from fallen men that his character provoked. The persecution proves that his spirit is in you, shining his light so powerfully that people can't but notice that you're actually like him, and some people will hate that. 
And it's important to note in verse 10 that Jesus says, blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And that's a really important caveat, for righteousness' sake. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 4.15, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a a meddler. In other words, if you do those things, you kind of deserve it, don't you? But he says instead in 1 Peter 4, 19, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. That's an important thing to recognize because um, have you ever acted like a jerk? I have acted like a jerk. Have you ever acted like a jerk, but at the time you actually believed you were acting in righteous indignation? that you were accurately representing Jesus by being a jerk. Oh, raise your hand. <laughs> God, you know it's true. You've done it and I've done it. So I want you to listen to that. First Peter 2, verses 19 and 20. This is a gracious thing. When, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it you endure? But if when you do good and you suffer for it and you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And now, now the fact of the matter is this, that Christians can be jerks. And what Jesus is not talking about here is suffering for the sake of being a jerk to somebody. He's talking about suffering for the sake of righteousness. When you're really honestly pursuing and hungering and thirsting for righteousness and showing forth the character of Christ, and yet you suffer, and you do so because of verse 11, others revile you, persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. It's false. In other words, you're not actually being a jerk. You're not doing things that are worthy of being reproached. So it's false and it's on account of Christ. In other words, they hate Jesus in you. They hate Jesus in you. Even though you're living forth with mercy and you're living forth with purity of heart and and you're a peacemaker, there are some men who still will hate that, and we'll see more about why later on. But Jesus says in verse 12, rejoice. That's how I want you to respond to the fact that people are persecuting you for my sake. I want you to rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets before you. And you may think to yourself, come on, Jesus. (laughs) Who here likes getting beaten? Anybody? I don't. Well, yeah, I don't like it either, Jack. I mean, it's, nobody wants to be slandered. Nobody wants their reputation drug through the mud. Nobody wants to lose their job on account of standing for Christ. Nobody wants to be yelled at. Nobody wants to be called a hater. Nobody wants to be slandered via social media. Nobody wants to be persecuted. How am I, Lord, maybe you've read this before and you asked this question. How am I supposed to rejoice in this? Well, firstly, the recognition of uh, It proves that you're in Christ. What a tremendous joy to know and have the assurance that I'm in Christ and they see so much of him in me that they hate me for his sake. That the Spirit is shining him through me so brightly that the world is taking notice. What a joy that is. But there are examples of real human beings rejoicing in the context of real suffering that it's it is possible. It's a gift of the Lord, and, and it's a gift of His Holy Spirit, but it's possible. In Acts chapter 16, after they had been beaten, Paul and Silas sat up in the middle of the night in prison, and they were doing what? They were praying and singing hymns to God, and I think that was probably the case because their backs hurt so bad it, they couldn't lie down. But they were rejoicing. And then in Acts chapter 5, you remember that the Jewish leaders called in the apostles and examined them, and then they sent them away and talked behind their backs. And then in verse 40, it says, when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they, that is the apostles, left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Well, why? Why? Uh, Well, because they recognized that as they persecuted the prophets who were before you, that other people had endured the same thing. And those people now surround you as a cloud of witnesses to show that you can endure it. And at the end, there is a conquest and a prize uh, in good company. But also there is a reward for you in heaven. The reward is great. There will be a full recompense of everything that you had to lose for the sake of Christ will be fully recompensed to you and more in the life that is to come. 
And so rejoice because it means that Christ is in you and it means that you belong to him. So even in the face of persecution and even because of the persecution, because you know the source of it, rejoice in it. So what, what responses should kingdom disciples expect from the world as you, as you go about that business of hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Well, disciples will suffer persecution. And I want to share with you some stats. These stats are true every week, not every year, not every month, every week around the world. Here are the stats. Every week around the world, 56 Christians are martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. Every week around the world. Every week around the world, 72 Christians are unjustly imprisoned for their faith in Christ. Every week around the world. Every week around the world, 182 churches are attacked, burned, or vandalized around the world every week. What do you expect? An expectation has consequences. Uh, Your expectations affect your decision making. I think one of the things that we as believers fall prey to is the same thing that you, ha- you see happen out in the world. Well, people will make a decision based upon their fear of the outcome instead of making a decision based upon what is right. Let me say that again. I'll make a decision based upon what I perceive the negative consequences or the negative outcome will be, and I'll make a decision to avoid those rather than making a decision based upon what is right and accepting that whatever consequences might fall. Now, you see this in the life of Pilate at the crucifixion of Jesus. In John 19, 12 and 13, Pilate sought to release Jesus, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. In other words, if you don't crucify this man, we will go and we will tell Caesar that you allowed a rival king to Caesar to live. And you'll have to live with the consequences of that. And so the text goes on to say that when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down upon the seat of judgment, and then he delivered Jesus over to them to be crucified. You see, he made a decision based upon what he feared the outcome would be. But Jesus, in John 7, 34, said, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. In other words, see to the heart of the matter, make decisions accordingly, and then accept the consequences. And so if we don't expect that suffering might very well ensue from hungering and thirsting for righteousness, we might avoid hungering and thirsting for righteousness because we don't want the consequences. Expectations also affect your relationship with God. If you don't expect to be persecuted and you are, then maybe it leads to disillusionment. It might lead you to doubt His love for you. If your expectation is, if I follow God and I love Him and I serve Him in the world, then my life will always and only be comfortable and full of ease and pleasant. That expectation will in all likelihood be radically disappointed and then it will, it will fracture or it will undercut the foundations of your faith itself because you never expected it to happen. And now you begin to doubt, does God love me? Does He see what I'm going through? Is He actually in control? But when you expect it, then you can render joyful obedience because you know the truth of Romans 5 and verse 8, that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The demonstration of God's love for you, again, is not found in the circumstances of this life. The demonstration of God's love for you is found in the circumstances of Christ's death. And his death stands as the forever proof of God's love for you, such that even when persecution happens and bad things come and you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it's not an indication that God has failed to love you because the cross triumphs over all the circumstances of this life and he demonstrates his love for you at the cross of Christ. So you see expectations change, change things. If, if you expect that persecution is normal, then your expectation changes your mindset about it and you can begin to approach it with rejoicing because hungering and thirsting for righteousness will not always produce a rosy outcome. Some people will respond with hatred and anger and you may be called to suffer and therefore expect this because expecting it is halfway toward, toward preparing for it and if you can prepare for it, then by the grace of God, you can even rejoice in it. So what should a kingdom disciple expect if 
he or she hungers and thirsts for righteousness. Well, you should expect that disciples will suffer persecution. But it is also true that disciples will prevent decay. As you hunger and thirst for righteousness, the Lord will use you to prevent decay. Look at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You know, in the Old Testament, in Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 13, uh, the Levitical law said that every offering had to be salted with salt. Uh, Paul says in Romans 12 and verse 1 that you are to pre present yourself as a living sacrifice. So if all sacrifices in the Old Testament had to be salted with salt and you're a living sacrifice, what has to be in you as you sacrifice for the Lord? You've got to be salty, right? You've got to be salty. There's no sacrifice without salt because salt preserved rot. So what would you not want to offer up to the Lord in the Old Testament? An offering that was spotted or blemished or diseased, how much worse would it be if the offering, the meat offering you offered to the Lord was rotted? They had to be salted with salt. Salt was also in the Old Testament a cleansing agent, not just a preservative that pre prevented against rot and guaranteed a pure sacrifice, but it was a cleansing agent. Uh, newborns were rubbed with salt to cleanse them and to prevent infection. Uh, people salted a wound, not proverbially to rub salt in a wound because you want to hurt someone's feelings, but to put salt in the wound because you want to prevent the wound from festering and becoming infected. You see this use, this purifying, this preventative use of salt symbolically in 2 Kings 2 when the prophet Elisha heals the waters of Jericho by doing what to them? He salts the water and the water is made clean and no longer harms the people. And so I want you to note in verse 13 that Jesus doesn't say, go and be salt. He says, you are the salt of the earth. By virtue of his salvation of you and his spirit in you, you are salt. In fact, by virtue of belonging to Christ, by virtue of his Holy Spirit in you, by virtue of the kingdom ethic of spiritual poverty in you, which acts out in mercy and of mourning over sin, which leads to purity of heart and of meekness, which leads to peacemaking, by virtue of all these things, you are salt. You preserve rot and you preserve decay. It's interesting because when Jesus in John 16 promises the Holy Spirit to his followers and he says that the Holy Spirit is going to come and take up residence in your heart, he says he, the Holy Spirit, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. There, there is a salting effect of believers in the world. Moreover, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. You stink like Jesus. You smell like him. You carry the aroma of Christ around because he is in you. But it's also true that by virtue of the choices you make and the words you speak, you either act like salt, which you are, or you don't act like salt. Consider what Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So there's a witnessing and a preserving effect among men by virtue of your spiritual saltiness. But verse 13, if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything. Now here's the thing, if your food has no taste, what do you do? Well, you sprinkle some salt on it. Or if you have a big chunk of meat and you don't have a freezer or refrigerator to put it in, what do you do? Well, you sprinkle salt on it to preserve it. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, it is now worthless. Um, think of a fruitless vineyard, a vineyard that doesn't produce any grapes, or a waterless spring. It bears promise but gives no fulfillment. And so... Uh, can salt that has lost its saltiness be salted again? No, it simply has to be thrown out. It's good for nothing but to be trampled. And so Jesus is saying this, that kingdom people are salty people. 
They're salty people. By their actions, by their very presence, by their words, they're salty people. And they, they prevent and must strive to prevent decay by means of their saltiness. So what responses should kingdom disciples expect from that hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Well, we should expect that we will prevent decay. Now, you know that I served as a chaplain in the Marine Corps for a number of years, and one of the experiences I had over and over was to walk into a room or to walk up to a, a group of Marines, and they were engaging in conversation as only Marines can engage in conversation. So just about every second or third word was some explicative, and then they would, somebody would notice that I was there. And, um, uh, and they'd say, oh, sorry, sorry, chaplain, sorry, uh, I, I, I didn't mean to, you know, to offend you or, or whatnot. And I would remind them, it's not me you have to worry about offending. But they would watch their language while a Christian was around. Isn't that amazing? Simply a representative of the Christ had an effect on them that they couldn't even really explain. So let me ask you, do people know that you're in Christ? Do you claim in a public way to belong to him? Do your words and your actions represent him or misrepresent him? So I will freely confess there is a reason that I don't have a Jesus fish on the back of my car. Sometimes I am a rude driver. Sometimes I am a thoughtless driver. Sometimes I speed. And I don't want to misrepresent Jesus. What about you? See, you are salt. Remember, you are that guy who is six foot, six inches tall in the, in the grocery aisle, a guy who's six foot six, and you can reach the top shelf. You are salt. The Holy Spirit is in you, and Christ is recreating his character in you. In one sense, you can't help it. But you are also commanded to season your speech with salt. You're commanded to be salty in the world and to, to have a preserving effect on, on people around you. So is your speech seasoned with salt? What about uh, the speech of social media? Okay. Uh, if somebody were, a, were looking at your, your Facebook feed or they were looking at your Instagram or they were looking at your Snapchat or they were looking at all those apps that only teenagers know about that they don't want their parents to know that they have, if you were looking at those things and somebody had to, had to describe your speech with a word. What would that word be? Would it be something like uh, encouraging or Christ-like or salty or Christian or holy? Or would it be angry? Would it be divisive? Would it be political? Would it be charged? We're supposed to salt, that is, preserve decay, not promote it. And recognize, where do your words come from? They come from your heart. Even as Jesus said in Matthew 12 and verse 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Every time you speak, you rip open your chest like Superman, except you're not just exposing the S on your chest, you're exposing your heart when you speak. And that goes for what you do in social media as well. So how is your heart? I don't want to suggest that the only remedy is this. You need to go try harder not to say bad things and to say good things. You should try. You should self-consciously think to yourself and pray, Lord, will you please equip me to speak in such a way that my words have a preservative effect. But the remedy, the ultimate remedy is, Jesus, will you please change my heart? Will you please change my heart? Because your prayer to that effect is your cooperation with the Lord. It is a form of pursuing saltiness. After all, the shorter catechism in question uh, 98 asks this, what is prayer? Great question. Fantastic answer. Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to His will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. Did you get that? That you offer up your desires, but that your desires are to be agreeable to his will. Agreeable to his will. Isn't it agreeable to his will that your words salt the earth? 
Certainly it is. Are you praying for it? Uh, words are just a part of our public saltiness. What about the things you leave unsaid, the things that you choose not to address? Or if you do choose to confront somebody, if you do choose, choose to correct error, or you do choose to, to engage in some kind of a political conversation or, or something that could be charged, are you doing so in such a way that you're winsome, that you're kind, that you assume the best of other people and of their motivations, that you don't retaliate in kind when somebody says something mean or snarky? Are you actually representing Jesus? Because after all, I, I want to point something out, and I've mentioned this before, but, but maybe it bears repeating again. As Jesus confronted people who were pagans, as Paul confronted people who were pagans, as the apostles confronted people who were pagans, people who were lost, they looked at them as sheep without a shepherd who had been led astray, and they dealt with them gently and with mercy even when they themselves were attacked. But their hard words were for the religious people who should have known better. And oftentimes, our hard words are for the sheep that are lost and shepherdless and battered by every wind of doctrine, and they don't even know they're being battered by winds of doctrine, while we reserve our soft and kind words for each other. And it should be exactly the other way around. Do people see Christ in you? Do they smell Him in you? Remember, saltless salt is useless, as useless as a waterless spring. So by your prayers, pursue saltiness because as disciples, the Lord will use you to prevent rot and to prevent decay. So, so what responses should kingdom disciples expect from the world? Well, we should expect that disciples will suffer persecution. We should expect that disciples will prevent decay, and we should expect that disciples will shine light. Look at verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You see, disciples shine light. You know that Jesus is the light of the world. That is exactly what he himself says in John chapter 8, 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And, and in Romans 8... The Apostle Paul teaches that the Holy Spirit in you is Christ in you, such that he says in Philippians 2.15, you shine as lights in the world. Do you realize that? You shine as lights in the world. In the same way he said, you are salt. You couldn't not be it if you tried. You are light. You are lights in the world. You shine as lights in the world because of the light of Christ who is in you by his Holy Spirit. So kingdom disciples can no more hide their light then you can hide a city on a hill that is lit up at night. Now just imagine that. You're driving through a dark plain, through the woods, through the forest, and all of a sudden you come out and you see a hill. And on the hill is a lit city on a dark night. Can you hide it from anybody with sight? No, not at all. You can't hide Christ in you any more than you can hide a city on a hill. And if you're a disciple, no disciple wants to hide that light, because why hide the Savior of the world? And so if you follow Jesus, you will draw attention. There's no such thing as a stealth disciple of Jesus, right? There is no such thing as a solitary disciple of Jesus. It's very, it's very common today for people to say things like, well, I'm spiritual but not religious, and so that's their way of not going to the church. But nobody is saved as a solitary stone. We're living stones who are being built together as a temple. Nobody is saved as a solitary finger, but rather everybody's a part of a body. We're all attached to each other. People are saved into a body. They're saved into a family. There's living stones in a temple. There are no solitary Christians, and there are no stealth Christians who want to be a Christian in private but in public disavow Christ. There's only one example of a stealth Christian in the entire New Testament, and it's Peter denying Jesus three times to avoid suffering like Jesus. Is that a great example of what it means to be a stealth disciple? Who wants to be that? It's a terrible example. It's held forth in Scripture as a terrible example, but rather the good example is Jesus' teaching from Matthew 10 and verse 27, what I tell you in the dark, say in the light, 
and what you hear whispered proclaim on the housetops. Uh, we, are, we are called not to hide, but rather to shine forth Christ who is the light within us. Jesus said of John the Baptist in John 5 and verse 35, he was a burning and a shining lamp. He was a burning and a shining lamp. You also are a lamp. What is a lamp created to do? To give light. And so nobody takes a lamp and puts it under a stand, right, or under a basket. But instead, you put it on a stand because it's created to give light. What's its purpose? To give light. And so you might ask the question, how do I do this? How do I shine? How do I give light? How do I act like a city on a hill? How do I act like a lamp in a house? And verse 16 answers you, good works. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. There is an intimate link between the saving work of Jesus in your heart and the good works of his people. And you know this because you know these verses from Ephesians 2. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so the grace of salvation inexorably and inevitably leads to and produces good works in Christians. Now, good works don't don't comprise any part of the cause of your salvation, but they do comprise a big part of the proof of your salvation. Because here's the fact of the matter. Saved people live differently. Saved people live differently. It's another way of saying Jesus Christ has his way in you, and he transforms you, and there is transformative power in Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit to recreate your character. Again, your personality might never change, but your character can and does and must. Saved people live so differently that the world notices. Saved people are poor in spirit and they live in mercy. Saved people mourn over the sin and they walk in the purity of their Savior. Saved people are meek and they make peace. Saved people hunger and thirst for righteousness. They don't hunger and thirst for career. Yes, they have a career. Yes, it's legitimate to labor well in your career. Yes, you should work hard at it. Yes, you should seek excellence in your career. But you don't hunger and thirst for career success. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. Saved people don't hunger and thirst for money. They hunger and thirst to use whatever money God gives them for the glory of Christ who gave it. Saved people don't don't hunger and thirst for Instagram likes. They hunger and thirst that by means of social media, which is simply a tool, they will bring glory to Christ Jesus and not to themselves. Saved people don't hunger and thirst for pleasure. They don't hunger and thirst for power. They don't hunger and thirst for self. Saved people, in other words, don't hunger and thirst for the same things for which the world hungers and thirsts. And saved people live in such a way that the world sees that you are different. Because you just want different things. And you speak in different ways. And you have a different attitude toward marriage and family and money and career. And you're not following the world. And it chases after things that you don't chase after. And because only those on whom the king has showered his grace live that way. Only those who have tasted the grace of Christ live that way. Then the world takes notice. And sometimes it takes notice and persecutes you. But other times it takes notice and gives grudging praise. Because it's forced to acknowledge these Christians are different. Glory to God for their works. So what responses should kingdom disciples expect from the world while disciples will shine light? In the year 165, Marcus Aurelius was the Roman Empire and the smallpox smallpox plagued uh, Rome, ravaged the city, and over the course of several years killed about a third of the inhabitants of Rome. The chief medical officer, so to speak, of the Roman Empire at the time was a guy named Galen, and he fled and went to a country cottage where he where he lived out the uh, plague. The populace, because we often take for granted this, if I get injured or I get hurt or I get sick, someone will take care of me. We just assume it. But do you know that that assumption is based upon the belief that human life matters? 
It's based upon the belief that you're an image bearer of God. It's based upon the conviction, the Christian teaching, that you have worth and value and dignity because you bear the image of your creator. And apart from Christian convictions, people didn't have that way of thinking. And so in 165 in Rome, this is what people did when a family member got sick. A wife, a husband, a son, a daughter, a brother or sister, a mother or father. They would take the family member in a blanket, take them out, drop them in the street, go inside the house and close the door and forget them. The streets were littered with people who received no food, no water, no shelter, no clothing, no basic human kindness or compassion because human beings are not basically kind or compassionate. We must be taught to be so through Christ Jesus. And so, a hundred years later, plague struck again, but by this time, the Roman Empire had been much more Christianized and Christians did something profoundly different. They kept the sick in their homes. They brought the sick of pagans into their homes. They nursed them. They gave them water. They bandaged their wounds. They cared for them. And many of them survived as a result, and many Christians died of smallpox as a result. But this is the point. If one person lives this way, if one person lives with that kind of self-denial, if one person shows that kind of ethic, the world can write it off and say, well, that person's just crazy. But when a whole church does that, when every last man, woman, and child in a community of believers has that ethos about them, and when the only thing that they have in common is the person of Jesus Christ, then the only conclusion you can reach is the power of God is among those people. You see, in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 8, listen to what Paul teaches. He says, at one time you were in darkness, but now you are the light. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Walk according to who you are. Walk according to what is good and right and true. Walk according to what is pleasing to the Lord. This is what Paul says. And how do you know what is pleasing to the Lord? Romans 12, be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Immerse yourself in the Word. It leads you to have the ability to discern what pleases God, what is good and right and true, and then ask Him in prayer for both the ability and the courage to walk accordingly. Pray for both. It's one thing to have the ability. It's another thing to have the courage in the face of trial or persecution. Ask for courage. Because when you do this, it shines light. And some men hate the light. You know this. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 19, this is the judgment, light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Some people are just going to hate it. Jesus is the light of the world and men hated and crucified him. John the Baptist shone as a burning and shining lamp and they hated and beheaded him. You bear light and it has a dual function though. One, you shine as a beacon of hope like a city on a hill. Can you imagine being a traveler in the ancient world where you're traveling in pitch black and you have nothing but a small lamp to guide your way, a lamp that allows you to see a foot in front of you so that you don't fall into a pit. There are wild animals around, there are bandits and robbers around, and you come around the corner and you see a city on a hill. <laughs> and there is safety, and there is shelter, and there is food and water. There is a place to lay my head for the night without having to worry that somebody's going to kill me in the middle of the night. That city on a hill is a beacon of hope, and when you shine the light of Christ, some people will see it exactly that way. But light also exposes darkness and the deeds done within it. And you will shine a light upon wickedness, and people who want to remain hidden will become angry and have violent reactions, and they will persecute you. But remember, the same sun that hardens the clay softens the wax. Your role is to shine. It's not yours to determine what the Lord will do with your light. It is yours to bear his light to a watching world. It is yours to hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's yours to pray 
and to seek to do good works. It's yours to do so, so consistently and clearly, not only as individuals, but as a congregation, that even pagans are forced to praise God for our conduct. What an amazing picture that is for the world, isn't it? Really tremendous. If we could do that, And I do believe in the transformative power that Christ possesses. And I believe that if we go to him and we ask him for that, that he will over time produce it in us as individuals and as a body. Disciples of the kingdom, what do you expect? Jesus gives you realistic expectations. It's yours to hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's yours to salt and to shine. And you may suffer persecution, but Christ will use you to prevent rot. And he will use you to shine a beacon of hope before the lost that cannot be hidden. Therefore, hunger and thirst, salt and shine, and let Jesus determine the outcomes. For this is a right expectation of kingdom living. Will you pray with me? Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the salvation we possess in him. And we thank you that he is about the business of transforming us, changing us into his own image and imbuing us with his own character. We pray that you would that you would even accelerate that process. We pray that you would grant us clear and right expectations. And we pray that as we, as we seek to act as salt and light in the world, that you would help us to recognize that some people will see that great beacon of hope and they will be drawn to it, inexorably drawn to Christ in us. And other people will be repelled and angered by Christ in us. And it's not ours to withhold the light, It's not ours to determine what you do with our saltiness. It's ours to serve as salt and light in a world and be willing to bear the consequences. To be willing to bear the consequences for him who first bore them for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.